Got it. Oh, he blew it up. What is up? And welcome back to the vlog. I'm currently in San Marcos, Texas, I think. And I'm at a very famous course, a course that I've been really, really wanting to get out to. And that is the Flying Armadillo course, but not just any course. It is one of the few courses in the world that has like committed a full course to par two layout. But I'm currently walking up the tower because I heard there's some good views up here. There's some wind chimes. Wow, this is a really cool view. It's the day after the open at Austin. And I figured what better time than right now on my way out of town, I'm heading to Florida. Time for me to try and get some aces out here at the flying armadillo. This is a view right here, a little pyramid basket. Very cool. I'm gonna be playing the mini course. There are two courses out here. One of them is a full 18, but the one that I hear the most exciting things about is the mini course. And I've got my, I'm going full Ricky Wysocki for the second week in a row, a bag full of putters, and that's all I need to get some aces. And this, this whole property is really cool. It's just very unique, very quirky. And I have a feeling that today you might see, we both might see some disc golf holes like nothing we've ever seen before. And as we're approaching the first tee right here, hole one, this is the fairway. And the only object in the way is a dinosaur. <laughs> I've always wanted to play this course, so I'm glad that you guys are here with me to experience it at the same time. I can't see the bass guy, you can only see the dinosaur, it's funny. Oh, did I juice it? No, no metal yet. But this is hole two, I got you on the wide angle. Tee pads right here. The basket's actually in that little shed. So it looks like it's like a forehand turnover or like a backhand skip shot. So we're gonna try both. Oh, I missed it. That one looks great. Oh, I hit the post. The open at Austin. Let's talk about that for a minute. Brand new course, brand new venue, all the things. Coming from the open at Belton, which is the, the former layout that we would play. Look at this basket placement right here. That's pretty freaking cool. But anyways, like I was saying, coming from the open at Belton, which is actually a course I really liked, I tried to come into this weekend with the same mindset that I did when I played Belton in 2021, which was basically no expectations. I have no history on the course. So I was going to make history and I was trying to make it good history. No matter how much I heard people talk about the course, I didn't take their word for it. I was just like, I'm gonna experience it for myself. And honestly, I think that that mindset from the get-go really helped me in the, in the grand scheme of things of how I finished this weekend. Vegas, I've played for six years in a row now. Waco is my third year in a row, so I knew what I was capable of. I knew past past trauma. The Open at Austin just really kind of allowed me to take a blank, uh, a blank slate and, and write a new story for the first time on tour in a while because a lot of the courses on tour are returning courses, not new anymore. Oh, do it. Oh, wow. So I played my first practice round on the course, really just kind of figured out my shots, wasn't thinking too much about anything, didn't really be too hard on myself or my shot selection, but I basically decided like, yeah, this is maybe not my favorite course I ever played. However, I do like the shots that I selected to throw and the ones that I was gonna be throwing in the tournament. So I just kind of kept my head in it. And then we hear about the weather that's coming in. It's gonna be cold and windy. And usually people are like, oh no. But to me, honestly, that's kind of a treat. I, I think that a course like that, when it's cold and windy, can really diminish the advantage of like the power throwers and everything like that. And it kind of brings everybody back down to, to like a more human level or mortal level. And I actually managed very well. I played with Parker Welk, Kevin Kiefer, and Zach Arlinghouse. And it was a great time, great card. I ended up piecing together a pretty solid round. I had the hot round on the card at two under, which at the time I had no idea what a good round was, but for the conditions that we had, two under actually put me in 19th place. And I, I definitely had some hiccups throughout the round, but uh, a little bit of a bounce back with a couple of good putts on the back stretch kept my head in it mostly. That's why I kept myself going is because I kept my head in it. I didn't give up. And two under put me in 19th place and that was the best placement I've had at a Pro Tour event so far this year after the first round. So just that alone really kind of set me going in the right direction for the rest of the weekend. This is hole four. The basket's right there. 
I'm, I don't think you can see the chains, but you might be able to see the pole. It's another forehand skip shot or a backhand turnover. I'm trying to keep them both warmed up right now because I've been doing this thing where I practice my backhands a crap ton and then my forehand feels rusty when it comes to game time, but my backhand is at least reliable in tournaments now, but I need my forehand to stay on top of its game like it was in like 2020 and 2021. Oh, just a fluff skip. That was an awful shot. I'll try the Annie, Annie turnover in there, see how it goes. Okay, I'll say one thing. That was heading in a great direction, but there's just trees in the way of the chains. After round one, I was pretty happy to be sitting in 19th. I really didn't think it was that bad. And I was only three strokes off the lead, which is kind of bizarre nowadays for being in 19th place. The scoring separation this weekend was really bizarre. Felt like if you gained a stroke or two, it could jump you 20 spots. But if you lost a stroke or two, it could drop you 30 spots. And that's kind of how I felt in round two. I found myself just kind of um, staying even. Like I, I wasn't going like super like over par or I wasn't going too, too far under par. I was just like bubbling at like the one under, two under number. While I'm watching my card mates, Joel, Nico, and Tristan, they're having similar woes, but in a different manner. Like they were on the brink of a great round and had to settle for a good round. But like, it's just one of those days where when you're watching players that are clearly beating you on the scorecard, beating themselves up much more than you were beating yourself up for your one under, it's just like, just can kind of bum you out, honestly. But that's, that's my own fault, nobody else's fault. I, I should have kept myself in it. I should have, I don't know, threw better, putted better. One mistake on hole nine, I missed the Mando with my roller and I was playing that hole for birdie. Followed up by two missed birdie putts really kind of just like put me down. And then like coming down the stretch, I got birdies on 14 and 16, but in my opinion, those are some of the easier holes in the course. So those ones I can always bank on coming around the stretch that I'm gonna get birdies on those two. Dropped myself out of the top 40 after I was saying you could, I could gain a couple strokes and jump a bunch of spots or lose a couple strokes and drop a bunch of spots. I unfortunately dropped a bunch of spots. This is the first hole so far that it's kind of just been like dead straight, nothing in the way. I got two tactics and a P1 and a P2. Aces only, by the way, we don't care about putts. Oh. Oh, come on. Oh, got it. Oh, what? I mean, I tried. Round two, had my buddy Sterling caddy for me again. He actually caddied for me at Waco in round three. And he's, he's buddies with my buddy Randy from Belize. Sterling is also from Belize. And it's always nice to just have, have somebody there with you that's on your team, supporting you, hyping you up, you know? It's, it's not always about like the weight off your back as far as like carrying a bag. For me, having a caddy is a lot to do with the vibe, the camaraderie, the support that you get from your caddy while you're on the course, going through some pretty stressful circumstances. Sterling, once again, second week in a row, very thankful to have him on the bag. Unfortunately, I couldn't shoot a very good round in round two, but a big shout out to him. A huge shout out to my buddy Dyer, Dyer Bentz. Every year I've come to Austin, I've stayed with Dyer since 2021, and he's the man, him and his girlfriend Penny. They've hosted me at their house. They've caddied for me before, and this year was no different, except this year we had an elite series in Austin, which was just extra special. So it was really cool to uh, bring Dyer out to the course and show him, show him a big Disc Golf Pro Tour event, because the Belton one was cool, but it was just a Silver Series, so it's not usually that top, top tier. Hole six here, we've got 120 feet, and the basket is in the ground. I think this is a empty your bag hole for sure. I wish that the uh, the forehand was a little more friendly, but it looks like it's a backhand skipper. So we're gonna try backhand skipper first, a little, a little slider. Use it like a ramp. Oh, come on. All right, let's see if I can hit it. Sidearm slider. Oh, it almost cut rolled in the basket. Dude. This is for Simon. Shout out to Simon. He got second place. Guy's cracked. Counter skip. 
No. All right, so we're on hole six. And I think just six holes in, this course speaks a lot to what I dream that disc golf can be. Disc golf doesn't have to be distance drivers and whatever, par fours and fives. Disc golf is being able to make a Frisbee course out of nature. And I think that this is the perfect example. They got rocks leaned up against the side, creating a ramp. And I, I don't know, that's just something to be admired. Like it's a short little hole, but the fact that the baskets in the ground is just like super, super cool. The only one thing, this is part of the reason I haven't put a basket in the ground at my own home course, is the only one thing about a basket in the ground is that a lot of crap can get collected. Like this one's got some rocks in the basket. Always a cool dynamic to a course when they do something special like that. This one is called the tunnel hole. I wonder why. See what we got, come on. Come on, baby. Oi! The P3X has back-to-back -back metal hits, by the way. Come on! Oh, it, the wind! What is that wind? All right, well, we have arrived at hole eight, and uh, this is an island hole. I'm up on a deck, if you can't tell, but this is an island hole, and the basket's on the other side of that clump of trees, so I think it's a turnover flick with the hunter, the P3X. Well, you gotta throw it better than that. Gotta be one of the signature holes on the course. A million different signs, but I can see chains. So we're gonna give this one a good run. Ready for this ace? P1 ace. Oh yeah, called it. Oh! Come on, I literally just called that. And it was literally perfect. Low right side and everything, and it just spit out. I, I need to replicate that. Like I, I threw it perfect. Oh yeah, now I'm just, now I'm scared. Don't mess with Texas. I'm gonna go at the, uh, the left green arrow sign and try and hyzer it in with my MD5. This would be a pretty sick shot. It'd be better with a tilt. Oh, I did it. Oh, I did it. I did it. That was so sick. We have success. And arguably, arguably probably the hardest line to take on this hole through here. And I think, I don't know if I went left or right of the no entry, but that right there is a little ace. MD5. I knew I would get one. There's a sad boy laying on the ground. So very happy. Got an ace today, baby. All right, without further ado, we're rolling right into hole 10. Seems like probably one of the trickier gaps on the course. Oh, man. Mm. Rung the cage, thought I had a chance to lift up and in. Halfway through this course, I would do anything to make a course like this. I would love to have beginners play in this course. I'd love to have experienced professionals like myself. It's just the type of disc golf that literally anyone can play. Somebody who has never touched a disc golf disc before in their life could play this course with ease. And it's plenty challenging at the same time for players of higher caliber because yeah, the holes might be 120 feet every time, but the obstacles and like the, the differentiating uh, challenges is what makes a course like this really, really cool. It also helps that they got cool little gimmicks, like a big buoy and a lighthouse out in the middle of the fairway. It's just something Something you don't get to see every day. All right, so I'm a total liar. Well, I'm not a liar. I just have never played here before. Um, the lighthouse isn't a gimmick. The lighthouse is the basket. I, I didn't even see it, but that's where we're going. Easy money, baby. That was, that was a good one. All right, let's try and hit it with a backhand. Drop. Got it. Boom, baby. Two lighthouse aces, come on. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, first one, P3X first try. Second one, P1. This is a really cool hole. And I'm really glad that I just rung two of those up. I don't know how the contraption works, but I'm assuming that the discs get like spit to the bottom. Okay, so this might be the coolest part. So obviously the basket's up there, but I think what happens is the discs. Oh, there it is. So, how do I get that? Oh, I just reach in like this? Okay. Ace, baby. Okay, we'll close that door. And, uh, oh, there's another one. Ace, baby. Three aces in the last three holes? All right, made it to hole 12. This one's begging for an ace as well. What's new? This one, 
There's a shout out to Ace Man Kalevi from Finland. Choose the disc, choose the basket, and throw inside the basket. Ah, oh, man, I kind of want to just ring one of these bells and then go in. That would be pretty fun. Drop. Oh, while well, I hit the bell. Well, not quite. I want to ring it. I think the strategy here might be to throw a disc as hard as I can to get the bell to swing out of the way, then throw it right in the chains. Dude, the wind is just not my friend right now. In Las Vegas, I was one of the best circle two putters in the tournament, yet one of the worst circle one putters in the tournament. And then at Waco, I putted fine circle one, but I only had one circle two make the entire weekend, and I hit it in the last five holes of the tournament. So clearly something was wrong. You can't go from the best to the worst like that. You know, I, I definitely was very aware of that stat. I knew how well I putted in Vegas, and I knew how good it felt to feel that confident from range. So this weekend, I just kind of attacked the basket with a different mentality. And I've used this mentality before, but it's not really like anything to do with like aggression. It has to do with like flight and feel for the, the putts. And I'll explain it, I'll explain it here. So sometimes when I'm putting, I'll line up and I'm, I'm a naturally a hyzer putter. So I'll line up on a slight hyzer and I'll aim like at the low right side. My worst fear is going right side, but pulling it. So then I'm like, whatever, maybe I'll be scared. And instead of aiming at the right side, I'll aim at the pull and then I'm hyzering before the basket. So I said, no more of that. Flatten out your putt as much as you can. And like, I'm very good at changing the angle of my putt. It's just a matter of picking one and committing to it. And I do this thing where I line up on like a slight ante but even though I'm lining up on a slight ante, when it comes out of my hand, it's actually a flat putt. But in my brain, I think it's on Anheuser, so I'm aiming at the middle. But it's just a matter of like not, not forcing myself to hyzer it. And um, it worked for the most part. I, I specifically committed to it very, very strongly in the final round. And that's where I kind of found my groove, like I said. My buddy Dyer caddied for me. It was a great time. He was a great vibe. He filmed a bunch of my shots and like really just, you know, kept my head in it. I started with a par on one, which is great. Uh, a really, really good par save on two after going out of bounds. Birdie on three. And then hole four, I could have birdied, but I messed up the upshot and I was not very happy about that. But I saved a good par again. Hole five, I was happy with the par. And hole six, is like a blank hyzer, like the, it, it was like a weird righty hyzer, but I birdied it going any sidearm all air, and I put it past the basket, which I've never seen anybody put their drive there. And then seven, I saved a good putt out of the bunker for par, so like even if I wasn't shooting like super far under par, it was a matter of like the feeling that I felt. I felt very in control of the round, like I was salvaging my mistakes, and I was just chipping away. It was a birdie here, birdie there, and then hole eight, I got a birdie. Nine par, 10, oh, hole 10, the first two rounds was my first circle one miss of the day, both rounds. And then the final round, we had different wind and I almost aced it skipping off the putting green, but then it went out of bounds. First bogey of the round, which is never a great thing. Like I always try and strive to go bogey free. You know, coming down the stretch, I missed another birdie putt and then had to save a couple pars. But then 13, I almost made a birdie putt from deep. And then 14 is one of the holes, like I said, I'm really counting on that one. I'm throwing standstill FD1 backhand. And I got that one the first two rounds and yesterday was no different. Put it like 20 feet, made the putt. And I was like, all right, let's get rolling. And then 15 threw a mind bender, late flip, parked it. 16 got up and down and, and hit a nice putt. And then I told Dyer, I knew the position I was in and I knew where I was out on the scoreboard. And I said, par, par, that's what we need is par, par because 17 and 18 can eat you alive. It can take you out of the tournament in a blink of an eye. Then 17, I throw my drive perfectly in the middle and I'm lined up with the grenade. And I go grenade, go over the top, and it just came spiking down inside the circle and I happened to make the putt. I was super pumped about that. Like I just wanted to par and got a birdie. And then hole 18 had got me the last two days. I went bogey, bogey the first two rounds trying to birdie it. So the final round, I'm like, I'm not laying down to die here. I'm taking it to this hole. I stepped up my CD2, ripped it up there, 20 footer, ended up cashing the 20 footer for birdie. And I birdied the last five holes of the tournament to shoot seven under for the round. 
and make my first cash of the year at a disc golf pro tour event which is pretty sad for me um missing cash at vegas was the first time i missed cash there since 2019 and i've still never made cash at waco which honestly to me is embarrassing but we're not going to talk about that open at austin got on the board I, I showed myself the player i truly am and i'm just glad that i kind of got my season back on track and really like convinced myself that i'm not a trash disc golfer and i i do deserve to be out here because I think everybody has those days where you're genuinely questioning yourself, saying, is this actually my path? Like, am I good enough? And this weekend, with the mistakes that I made and the troubles that I faced, and I was still able to, to cash, I think I proved to myself. And a lot of the credit honestly goes to Dyer. He was a great vibe the final round. Like, we had a great time together. He was just very very thankful to be out there and you know he's a good friend of mine i've known him for over two years now always a good time to have a good homie supporting you especially when you're trying to claw back into the mix and i did exactly that and i was the only person in the field to birdie the last five holes although simon did go five down on the last five but he got an eagle on 16 and a par on 17 so got you there simon this is the hole that i've been anticipating the most they call this the ultimate gimmick hole so as you can see the basket's on the other side of those slats. You can go through the slat, but you can also go forehand roller up the right side. You can go bank shot, low left, lo high left, high right. You can go forehand roller up and over. You can go freaking through the through the chute underneath where it says Dillo, right straight through the slats and just ace it. Oh no. Oh geez. Bank shot left side. Oh! I want to put one in that. I want to try and put one in the AC a little shoot. No! Ah, oh, I just missed. We're going for the, the red one. We're going bar down. Bar down, Selly. Oh, no! I'm going to try for the orange. Or maybe the teal again. Oh, hit chains. Definitely going forehand roller with the MD5. Got to go for the, the yellow. But now, I don't know if you can see it, but my P2 is in the way. So that's going to cause an issue. Come on, let's go. Let's go, baby. That was cash money. That's two aces for the MD5 today. Simon, what do you guys think? Through the chute, through the slats. I'm going to try and go through the slats because that was the one that I truly like failed on. Oh, I went through the slat and then chained out off the bank. This might be one of the most fun disc golf holes I have ever played. All right, we're gonna try and go through the chute. I wanna know what happens. What? What? <laughs> it didn't come down. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bro. <laughs> uh, is that two meter rule? <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible, but it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like it'll go in. Okay, it has to be going so slow. Here, let's watch this. I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to film it, but. Uh. Hey, that's more like it. They call this one the roller hole. Is this the smallest gap you've ever seen off a tee pad? For me, it probably is. But if you can't see that arrow on the ramp, it's begging for a roller. Nope, too much cut. No, yes, no. I found a collection of um, uh, beginners. That's right, we got one disc beginners. Let's go. Yeah, what are you throwing? I'm throwing the, uh, the fly hot, rest in peace, Mr. Coot. You will be missed. I wrote the date he died. Um, this disc unfortunately took his life. A Coot? At Las Vegas. Oh, poor Coot. So we made a memorial for him. You guys like this course? Yeah, Probably the best favorite course, course it should be on tour. I think this is the best course I ever played. Yes. But we are going to get them on camera throwing probably my favorite hole in the course, the gimmick hole. But these guys are throwing drivers. Oh, wow. I might be able to make that. I don't know. All right, Ezra Robinson got his trusty F7. Parked it. I'm going to go for the... See, he's no fun. He's like trying to like... Somebody's got to go backhand roller down the yellow. Uh, all right. oh. I'm going to go full power with this. Oh, he blew it up. 
<laughs> oh man it's really cool actually i just pulled into the parking lot earlier i knew that they were out here and i was trying to get marky chap and trevin to come join me for the round they uh they had no dice they wanted to get going because we're playing Tallahassee next. So we got quite the drive ahead of us in the next couple days. They just wanted to get a head start. I was pretty happy when I pulled in the parking lot thinking I was just gonna be like, just me out here. And uh, first thing I see is Alden Harris's van. Alden and them, the Robinsons and Gannon, they're always a good time. Always very, very fun to hang out with. So we're, we're clearly all having, all having as much fun as possible out here. And that's what it's all about. Oh, off the top. Oh, geez because I said I was gonna ace it. Just a little hanging basket. I've never aced with Simon. That's what we're gonna throw now. For the rest of the course, I'm just gonna try and ace with Simon. Every single time I throw the Simon P2, I'm always trying to ace. Come on, do it for him, second place. Oh, I noticed we have a couple aces so far this round, but what we don't have is a skip ace. And we even have a roller ace. Oh! <laughs> Ah, I got the pole, one more. All right, here we go, hole 18. As you would expect, the Texas tee pad, shocker. But this one's actually really cool. We're taking this one down to the saloon. Time for a little Texas shootout, the Alamo hole it's called. All right, obviously last hole, we got our bag. Gotta empty it. You just gotta empty it. We're gonna save Simon for last. No way! No, that's not committed. Dude, last shot of the day for Simon. Please, come on! I am so glad that I came and played this course. This is so much fun. Like I said, running into the prodigy boys over here. They're still out here. There's the champ right there. It's a different type of disc golf. It's a lost side of the sport, which is like, like I said, the distance. The distance problem. Oh, we gotta go in the house here. Pick up Simon. Ezra's up like a million. All right. <laughs> so Ezra here's up by so many strokes. So I'm making Amanda where you have to be inside. What is it? The Alamo. The Alamo. And if you're not inside, of, if you're not inside of it off the drive, you have to re-tee with the stroke penalty. You have to re-tee. And there. We need Ezra to blow up. And you're throwing driver. Yes. Well, so what else would we throw? Perfect. Oh, look at that baby go. <laughs> It's gonna, yep, I was about to say, that's about to pop back in frame. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go, it's, it rolled behind the tower, Alden. Fly out of the hand, hit on roller, and just be parked. Parked. Okay, here we go. Oh! Here's, a, here's the champ, apparently. Okay. <laughs> Good safe play. Alright. I'm gonna go hammer. Oh, he almost skipped through the window. Alden, pick that up. They're playing with freaking 120 gram F7s, which is like the most understable driver that Prodigy makes. But that's what it's all about here at the Flying Armadillo. It's not about score. I mean, they are playing for score, but they're just, they're literally just out here having the time of their lives the same way I just had the time of my life playing by myself. Something about a short, short course with all these little quirky lines and different challenges to do. It's just like a completely different experience from what we're used to on the tour. You know, not every single course has to be par fours and fives and distance drivers. Actually, this course is the highest rated course in Texas. The problem is it doesn't um, abide by like the U-Disc rankings because it is only a putter course. That course is fantastic. Great final round, jumped up to 34th. I think I climbed like 12 spots in the last round with my Neg7. Very proud of myself for that. And also very happy to be getting out of Texas. It's gonna be back to Florida and then Georgia from here. Georgia, my favorite time of year. So, or at least favorite time of the first half of the year. As always, thank you for tuning in. Like, subscribe, and we will see you next time. Boom!